God bless you. God bless you tonight. Amen. We've got a dynamic, dynamic Bible study for you tonight. If you tuned in Sunday, amen, you heard a powerful message from this man of God that uh, will be speaking tonight. You, you, you hear him all the time, and we thank God, amen, for him. But I would just like to say tonight that uh, I would like to invite everyone to join us Sunday morning at 11 o'clock. We're going to be celebrating Pentecost. Uh, and we're asking everyone to wear white when they come. I mean, from head to toe, you can wear a white hat, white beard, um, or <laughs> amen. Uh, it's all white, amen, to signify the purifying power of the Holy Spirit. And I want you to know one thing, that God sent COVID, amen, to remind us that the church should be a place where purity is sought, where purity is sought after, where holiness is sought after where commitment to God is sought after. We want to share some things with you on Sunday morning. So please come and celebrate Pentecost with us. It's not just a celebration, but it's a time of reflection. It's a time where we can uh, perhaps remind you that this gift of the Holy Ghost is for you, and it's for us, and it's for everyone. Prayerfully, the, the, the gift of the Holy Ghost would be predominant in our churches so that we will possess the power that we're supposed to as a church, that when men and women come to the church, they, they, they might be uh, uh, convicted by the word, they might be delivered by the power of God, and they might be strengthened by the power of the gift of the Holy Ghost. It's a gift, hallelujah. Who does not want a gift? Praise the Lord, amen. And so we want to celebrate Pentecost. Man, I can preach about that. Y'all know I can right now, right? Hallelujah. But we've got to go on to our Bible study. But join us Sunday morning. Amen. God bless you. Listen, I'm Bishop Marcus Irving. You're here. Amen. With uh, 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 And you join the Albany Christian Life Center Wednesday night Bible study. And I'm going to relinquish it right now and turn you into the hands of our speaker for tonight none other than bishop of the right pastor lj johnson put your virtual hands together and receive him with a wonderful round of applause amen well amen it's good to be here with you all thank you for joining us thank you for that wonderful introduction bishop Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father God, we praise you and we thank you for this time to gather together in your word. We ask you to move by your spirit, move by power and, and might. Touch every heart. In Jesus' name I pray, amen and amen. Mark the 14th chapter. What do you know about Jesus? Let me uh, kind of give a little, uh, intro a reminder on our book of Mark. In a way of introduction, the gospel is neither a discussion nor a debate, said Dr. Paul S. Reeves. It is an announcement. Uh, Mark wasted no time in giving that announcement for it is found in the opening words of this gospel, this book, the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the son of God, Mark 1 and 1. We see that Matthew wrote primarily for the Jew. So he opened his book with the genealogy. After all, he had to prove to his readers that Jesus Christ is, is indeed the rightful heir to David's throne. And since Luke focused mainly on the compassionate ministry of the son of man, he devoted the early chapters of his book to a record of the savior's birth. Luke emphasized Jesus's humanity for he knew the Greek readers 
would identify with the perfect babe who grew up to be the perfect man. As we look in John's gospel, John's gospel begins with a statement about eternity. In the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. Why? Why begin like this? Because John wrote to prove to the world that Jesus Christ of Nazareth is the son of God. The subject of John's gospel is the deity of Christ. But the object of his gospel is to encourage his readers to believe on this savior and receive the gift of eternal life. Amen. Where does Mark's gospel fit in? Mark wrote for the Romans. And his theme is Jesus Christ, the servant. If we had to pick a key verse in this gospel, it would be Mark 10, 45. For even the son of man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. See, the fact that Mark wrote with the Romans in mind helped us understand. I want you to keep that in mind. It helps us to understand his style and approach. See, the emphasis in this gospel is on activity. Mark describes Jesus as, as he busily moves from place to place and meets the physical and spiritual needs of all kinds of people. One of Mark's favorite, favorite words is, or phrase is straightway, meaning immediately. Mark does, Mark does not record many of our Lord's sermons because his emphasis is on what Jesus did rather than what Jesus said. He reveals Jesus as God's servant, sent to minister to suffering people and to die for the sins of the world. Let's dive in the 14th chapter, starting at verse, verse one, reading from the New King James Version. After two days, it was the Passover, and the feast of unleavened bread. And the chief priests and the scribes sought how they might take him by trickery and put him to death. But they said, not during the feast, lest there be an uproar of the people. These, these first two verses are so powerful. You see, in two days would be two of the greatest celebrations in Jewish history. Let's talk about that a little bit. The Feast of Unleavened Bread, or excuse me, the Feast of the Passover fell on the on 14th of Nisan. That is about April 14th. The Feast of Unleavened Bread consisted of the seven days following the Passover. See, the Passover itself was a major feast and was kept like a Sabbath. The Feast of Unleavened Bread was called a minor festival. And though no new work could be begun during it, such work as was necessary for public interest or to provide against private loss was allowable. The really great day was Passover day. The Passover was one of the three compulsory feasts the others were the Feast of Pentecost and the Feast of Tabernacles. The feast, at the feast, every male adult Jew who lived within 15 miles of Jerusalem was bound or was required to come. In Exodus 12, the Passover commemorated the deliverance of the children of Israel from their bondage in Egypt. God has sent plague after plague on Egypt. And as each plague came, Pharaoh promised to let the people go. But when each plague abated, he hardened his heart and went back on his word. Finally, there came a terrible night when the angel of death was to walk through the land of Egypt and slay every firstborn in every home. The Israelites were to smear the top of the doorposts with the blood of the lamb. And when the angel of death saw the doorpost so marked, he would pass over the house 
and its occupants would be safe. Before they went on their way, the Israelites were to eat a meal of roasted lamb and unleavened bread. It was that Passover, that deliverance, and that meal that the feast of the Passover commemorated. Every possible preparation was made for the Passover for a month beforehand. You see, its meaning was expounded in the synagogue and its lesson was taught daily in the schools. See, the aim was that no one should come ignorant and unprepared to the feast. So they all would know that the lamb reminded them of the blood that was applied to the doorposts in Egypt to keep the angel of death from slaying the firstborn. The bread reminded them of their haste and leaving Egypt. And the bitter herbs spoke of their suffering as Pharaoh's slaves. In the midst of this great celebration of national history, the religious leaders were plotting on how to kill Jesus. The chief priest, the highest ranking priest, who are supposed to conduct the sacred ordinances of the Lord on behalf of the people. Instead, they are full, with, full of jealousy and murder is infested in their hearts. The scribes, members of a learned class in Israel who study the scriptures, they know the law, yet they are about to break several commandments, murder, being one of them. In an attempt to give us better, a better picture of what's going on in verse two, you see, it was the ambition of all Jews to eat at least one Passover in Jerusalem before they died. Therefore, from every country in the world, pilgrims came flocking to the Passover feast. During the Passover, all lodging was free. Jerusalem could not hold the crowds. And Bethany and Bethpage were two of the neighboring villages where pilgrims lodged. It's historically said that in an ad, that in, excuse me, that in AD 65, there were close to 3 million pilgrims in Jerusalem. Just to give you an idea of how large the crowds could become. You see, it was there that the problem of the Jewish authorities lay. During the Passover, feelings ran very high. The remembrance of old deliverance from Egypt made the people long for a new deliverance from Rome. At no time was nationalist, nationalist feeling so intense. You see, Jerusalem was not the Roman headquarters in Judea. The governor had his residence in the, and the soldiers were stationed in Caesarea. During the Passover time, special detachments of troops were drafted into Jerusalem and quartered in the Tower of Antonia, which overlooked the temple. The Romans knew that at Passover, anything might happen. And they were taking no chances. You see, the Jewish authorities knew that in an inflammable atmosphere like this, the arrest of Jesus might provoke a riot. That is why they sought some secret plan to arrest Jesus and have him in their power before the people knew anything about it. See, the last act of Jesus's Life was to be played out in a city crammed with Jews who had come from the ends of the earth. They had come to commemorate the event whereby their nation was delivered from slavery in Egypt, from Egypt long ago. It was at the very time that God's deliverer of all humanity will be crucified upon the cross. Diving into verse three of this 14th chapter. 
And being in Bethany at the house of Simon the leper, as he sat at the table, a woman came having an alabaster flask of very costly oil of spikenard. Then she broke the flask and poured it on his head. But there were some who were indignant among themselves and said, why was this fragrant oil wasted? For it might have been sold for more than 300 denarii and given to the poor. And they criticized her sharply. But Jesus said, let her alone. Why do you trouble her? She has done a good work for me, for you have the poor with you always. And wherever you and whenever you wish, you may do them good. But me, you do not have always. She has done what she could. She has come beforehand to anoint my body for burial. Verse 9, assuredly I say to you, wherever this gospel is preached in the whole world, what this woman has done will also be told of a memorial to her. Mm. The tragedy of this story lies in the fact that it tells us of almost the last act of kindness, kindness that Jesus had done to him. He was in the village of Bethany in the house of a man called Simon the leper. He bears that title as a testimony to his healing. People did not sit to eat. They reclined on low couches. Imagine that. They lay on couches resting on the left elbow and using the right hand to take their food. Anyone coming up to those who were lying like this would stand well above them. To Jesus, there came a woman with an alabaster flask of oil. It was a custom to pour a few drops of oil on a guest when he arrived. That was the custom at the house. Or when he sat down to a meal, you, could, you would pour a few oils, drops of oil on him. See, this flask held spikenard, which was a very precious oil made from a rare plant that came far off from India. But it was not a few drops that this woman poured on the head of Jesus. She broke the seal and anointed Jesus with the whole contents. There may be more than one reason why she broke the seal and poured the flask on him. Maybe she broke it as a sign that all was used. There was a custom in the Middle East that if a glass was used by a distinguished guest, that that glass would be broken so that it would never again be touched by the hand of any lesser person. Maybe there was something of that in the woman's mind, but there was one thing not in her mind, which Jesus saw. It was also the custom in this part of the world first to bathe, then to anoint the bodies of the dead. After the body had been anointed, the flask in which the oil had been contained was broken and the fragments were laid with the dead body in the tomb. Although she did not mean it so, that was the very thing this woman was doing. You see, her action provoked the grudging criticism of some of the bystanders. The flask was more, what was in the flask was more than 300 denarii. A denarius was a Roman coin, which was a working man's daily wage. It would have cost an ordinary man almost a year to buy the flask of ointment. To some, it seemed a shameful waste. The money might have been given to the poor, but Jesus understood. He quoted their own scriptures to them. Deuteronomy 15 11, the Revised Standard Version says, the poor 
will never cease out of the land. Jesus goes on to say, you will help the poor anytime, but you have not long to do anything for me. This he said is like anointing my body beforehand for its burial. See, the story shows the action of love. Jesus said that it was a lovely thing that the woman had done. In Greek, there are two words for good. There is agathos, which describes a thing which is morally good. And there is kalos, which describes a thing which is not only good, but lovely. A thing might be agathos and yet be hard, stern, a store, unattractive. But a thing which is kalos is captivating and lovely with a certain bloom of charm upon it. You see, Jesus was trying to convey, if love is true, there must always be a certain extravagance in it. It does not nicely calculate the less or the more. It is not concerned to see how little it can decently give. If it gave all it had, the gift would still be too little. There is a recklessness and love which refuses to count the cost. You see, love can see that there are things, the chance to do which comes only once. See, it is one of the tragedies of life that often we are moved to do something, do something fine, and we do not do it. It may be that we are too shy and feel awkward about it. It may be that second thought suggests a more prudent course. I hope you're listening to me. It occurs in the simplest things. The impulse to send a letter of thanks. The impulse to tell someone of our love or gratitude. See, the impulse to give some special gift or speak some special word. The tragedy is that the impulse is so often strangled at birth. This world would be so much lovelier if there were more people like this woman who acted on her impulse of love. How that last extravagant, impulsive kindness must have lifted Jesus's heart. Once again, we see the invincible confidence of Jesus. The cross loomed close ahead. Now, but he never believed that it would be the end. He believed that the good news, the gospel, would go all around the world. And with the gospel would go the story of this lovely thing done with reckless extravagance done on the impulse of the moment, done out of a heart of love. As we read verses 10 and 11 of this chapter, then Judas Iscariot, one of the 12, went to the chief priests to betray him to them. And when they heard it, they were glad and promised to give him money. So he sought how he might conveniently betray him. Mm. You see, it is with consummate artistry that Mark sets side by side the anointing at Bethany and the betrayal by Judas. See, the act of generous love and the act of terrible treachery. Standing in sharp contrast to the love and devotion of the woman was the hatred and treachery of Judas. The disciple who, who is understandably referred to last and the least of the 12. He was the son of Simon, who was called Iscariot. The name Iscariot means man of Kiriath, which was a small town in Judea 
about 23 miles south of Jerusalem. Thus, Judas was not a Galilean like the other disciples. It is clear that Judas never had any spiritual interest in Jesus. He was attracted to him because he expected Jesus to become a powerful religious and political leader. He saw great potential for power, wealth, and prestige through his association with him. Uh, one of the scripture Bible notes say, it is easy to overlook the fact that Jesus chose Judas to be his disciple with the other disciples. You see, Judas shared a persistent misunderstanding of Jesus's mission. See, they all expected Jesus to make the right political moves. When he kept talking about dying, they all felt varying degrees of fear and disappointment. The exact motivation behind Judas's betrayal is unknown. Judas accepted payment to set Jesus up for the religious leaders. Verses 12 through 16. Now on the first day of unleavened bread, when they killed the Passover lamb, his disciples said to him, where do you want us to go and prepare that you may eat the Passover? And he sent out two of his disciples and said to them, go into the city and a man will meet you carrying a pitcher of water. Follow him wherever he goes in say to the master of the house, the teacher says, where is the guest room in which I may eat the Passover with my disciples? Then he will show you a large upper room, furnished and prepared. There make ready for us. So his disciples went out and came into the city and found it just as he had said to them. And they prepared the Passover. <laughs> His disciples wished to know where they would eat the Passover. Jesus sent them into Jerusalem with instructions to look for a man carrying a water pitcher. That was a prearranged signal for to carry a water pot was a woman's duty. It was a thing that no man ever did. A man with a water pot on his shoulder would be very easy to pick out in a crowd. You see, Jesus did not leave things until the last minute. Long ago, he had arranged just how it was to be found. Excuse me. The larger Jewish houses had upper rooms. Such houses looked exactly like a smaller box placed on top of a bigger box. The smaller box was the upper room. And it was approached by outside stairs making it unnecessary to go through the main room. The upper room had many uses. It was a storeroom. It was a place for quiet. It was a place for meditation. And it was a guest room for visitors. But in particular, it was the place where a rabbi taught his chosen band of intimate disciples. Jesus was following the custom that any Jewish rabbi might follow. What were the preparations that Jew made for the Passover? First was the ceremonious search, the ceremony search for leaven before the Passover. Every particle of leaven must be banished from the house. That was because the first Passover in Egypt had been eaten with unleavened bread. Unleavened bread is not like bread at all. It is like a water biscuit, a little a wafer. It had been or a it had been used in Egypt because it can be baked much more quickly than a loaf of baked a bread loaf baked with leaven. And you see, the first Passover, the Passover of escape from Egypt, had been eaten in haste. With every one ready for the road. They were all ready for the road. In addition, leaven was the symbol of corruption. 
Leaven is fermented dough. And Jews identified fermentation with putrefaction. And so leaven stood for rottenness. The day before the Passover, the master of the house took a light, took a lighted candle and ceremonially, ceremonially searched the house for leaven. Before the search, he prayed, blessed art thou, Yahweh our God, king of the universe, who has sanctified us by thy commandments and commanded us to remove the leaven. At the end of the search, the householder said, all the leaven that is in my possession, that which I have seen and that which I have not seen, be it null, be it accounted as dust of the earth. Next, on the afternoon before the Passover lamb, all the people came to the temple. The worshiper must slay his own lamb, there, thereby, as it were, making his own sacrifice. But in the Jewish eyes, all blood was sacred to God because Jews equated the blood and the life. It was quite natural to do so because if a person or animal is wounded, as the blood flows away, so does life. So in the temple, the worshipers slew his own lamb. Between the worshipers and the altar were two long lines of priests, each with gold or silver bowls to collect the lamb's blood. Then the lamb was carried to be roasted. It must not be boiled. Nothing must touch it, not even the sides of a pot. Certain things were necessary, and these were the things the disciples would have to get ready. There was a lamb to remind them of their houses, of how their houses had been protected by the badge of blood when the angel of death passed through Egypt. There was the unleavened bread to remind them of the bread they had eaten in haste when they escaped from slavery. There was a bowl of salt water to remind them of the tears they had shed in Egypt and of the waters of the Red Sea through which they had miracul miraculously passed through to safety. There was a collection of bitter herbs to remind them of the bitterness of slavery in Egypt. There was a paste. It was a mixture of apples, dates, pomegranates, and nuts to remind them of the clay which they had made bricks in Egypt. Through it, through it, or in the midst of it, there were sticks of cinnamon to remind them of the straw of which they used to, to help make the bricks. Such were the preparations which had to be made for the Passover. Every detail spoke of the great day of deliverance, the day when God liberated his people from their bondage in Egypt. It was at this feast that he, Jesus, would liberate the world, the one who liberated the world from sin, or who would eventually liberate the world from sin, was to sit and eat his last meal with his disciples. Starting at verse 17, 17 through 21. In the evening he came with the 12. Now as he sat and ate, Jesus said, assuredly I say to you, one of you who eats with me will betray me. And they began to be sorrowful and say to him, one by one, is it I? And another said, is it I? He answered and said to them, it is one of the 12 who dips with me in the dish. The son of man indeed goes just as it is written of him, but woe to that man 
by whom the son of man is betrayed, it would have been good for that man if he had never been born. Oh, what a powerful statement. In the present construction of the self-sacrifice of Jesus in the Last Supper, there's a, con there's a contrast dramatically with the infidelity of the disciples. Infidelity, I got it. It is, in other words, not the worthy for whom Jesus lays down his life, but precisely for the unworthy, even cowardice and unfaithful followers. See, this scenario illustrates the truth of Romans 5 and 8. God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. First, we see the betrayal of Judas in verses 10 and 11. Here, the concern <clears throat> is the betrayal of all the disciples. At Bethany, the woman anoints Jesus' body for burial. At the Last Supper, Jesus gives his body for sinners. We see in verse 17, according to Exodus 12, that instructs a man to gather his household at the table and his neighbors as well if his family, if the neighbor's family is too small to consume a whole Passover lamb. See that the meal Jesus shares with the disciples is a Passover meal is clear. From the statements in verse 14, one through two in verses 12, and the description of the preparation for the Passover in verses 13 through 16, immediately preceding. So the Passover was a family celebration, which means that women and children were a normal and necessary part of the meal. And in the course of the meal, the youngest boy present asked prescribed questions that the householder answered by retelling the story of the Exodus and by explaining its meaning as symbolized in the Passover meal. Mark's account of the Last Supper is selective. It focuses only on Jesus' betrayal and his impending death. See, as, the, as his impending death, as the fulfillment of the Passover sacrifice. See, the fact that Mark does not record the entire Passover ceremony or mention the presence of women and perhaps children does not imply that the meal was not a Passover meal or that there were no women present. Mark counts on his readers to know what a Passover meal was like. You see, but he relates only those portions significant for Jesus's revelation. As far as the women are concerned, there are several clues in chapters 14 and 15, suggesting their presence at the Last Supper. When evening came, Jesus arrived with the 12. This begins the description of Jesus's final gathering with the 12 in his earthly ministry. It is the final gathering. The holiest festival of the Jewish year, Passover commemorated the deliverance from Egypt. When the angel of death passed over the firstborn in Jewish homes with the lamb's blood over the doorposts. As the eldest male interpreted the feast, accents fell on remembering their past deliverance from Egypt and on anticipating the future redemption of the Messiah. See, the opening reference of the Last Supper in verse 18 comes several hours into the Passover meal because the actual meal was divided into four parts. So the group is reclining, which was the customary position in the ancient world for eating, feast, and formal meals if not all meals. The reference to eating signals the third phase of the meal. 
in the midst of the meal, Jesus solemnly announces, I tell you the truth. One of you will betray me. Mm. The celebration of Holy Communion is the purest and holiest moment of the church's life, symbolized by polished chalices and linen altar cloths. What bitter irony to recall this feast, reminiscent of victory and joy, and it began with an announcement of treachery. I said it began with an announcement of treachery. The account of the Last Supper begins on the note of betrayal. And all other elements of the meal acquiesce to it. One who is eating with me. You see, it does not limit the field of suspects, but it expands it. For everyone present eats with Jesus. See, the saying is framing is framed according to Psalms 41 and 9, where a righteous man is betrayed by a friend. See, Jesus does not mention Judas. His words do not provide relief by identifying the culprit. But its ambiguity provokes soul searching in each disciple. See, the announcement evokes grief and protest. The word for Greek which I cannot pronounce, the, the word for grief and the Greek, which I cannot pronounce, is used only twice in Mark. Chapter 10, verse 22, and in this portion, chapter 14 and verse 19. Both times it speaks of those who fail Jesus. See, there is joy in following Jesus on the way, but grief in failing him. One by one, each inquires, is it I? Or a better breakdown of that is surely not I. Jesus says, it is one of the 12 who dips with me in the dish. This clarification limits the culprits to the 12 and exonerates other members at the Passover meal. See, the likely suspects, in other words, are dismissed. And all the intimate companions, they whose hands have been in Jesus' bowl are suspect. Oh my, this is not in my notes, but I thought about that. That moment when Jesus said that, I can imagine disciples probably was kind of hesitant to dip back in the bowl once he said that. Wait a minute, I, I don't want to, you know, just the, the, the thought of that, just how that, that shook the meal. I mean, Judas knew that it was him, but the others were wondering what was going on because they still were shaky about all the things Jesus had said. They still were shaky about this death and this resurrection. So they were wondering was it in them or were they capable of this? See, there may have been only one traitor in the formal sense, but by dawn, all the disciples will betray Jesus. If not by greed in verses 10 and 11, we see then from weakness, verses 37, 42, or fear or cowardice, surely not I. How that protest echoes down the centuries. Oh, this verse is one of the most suggestive verses in scriptures on the relationship between divine casualty and human responsibility. It, is all, it also gives us a rare insight into the mind of Jesus. That the saying represents the mind of Jesus is evinced by the presence of Son of Man. See, a title used only by Jesus of himself and not by the early church of Jesus. Of special interest is the statement that son of man will go just, at, just as it has been written about him. The phrase it is written clarifies the sense of divine purpose or foreordination. See, there is no place in the pre-Christian tradition, however, 
where the son of man is destined to suffer. The figure who is destined to suffer is rather the servant of the Lord. Isaiah 53, 6 and 10. The idea that the son of man must be betrayed and suffer is meaningful only if Jesus, as the son of man, identifies himself with the suffering servant of the Lord and sees in his passion the fulfillment of the vicarious atonement of others. Isaiah 53 and 4. The paradox of the crucifixion, crucifixion and atonement is presented in Jesus' words at the Last Supper. The betrayer was one of Jesus' chosen disciples. His betrayal was a grave evil, but it all seemed necessary for the fulfillment of God's plan. Thus Jesus goes in accordance with God's predetermined will, but the betrayer is not thereby exonerated of guilt. I said the betrayer is not thereby exonerated of guilt. Neither Jesus nor Judas is an instrument a blind faith or a pawn of divine strategy. But woe to that man by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. It would have been better, it would have been good for that man if he had never been born. You see, divine providence neither cancels human freedom nor relieves responsibility for moral choices. I'm going to say that again. Divine providence neither cancels human freedom nor relieves responsibility for moral choices. Both currents of divine foreordination and human free will intersect. And the Greek verb meaning to deliver up or hand over or betrayed in one act. Jesus is employed in God's holy and necessary purpose and betrayed by Judas to his enemies. Let me close this out with these verses, 22 through 26. And as they were eating, Jesus took bread, blessed and broke it and gave it to them and said, take, eat, this is my body. Then he took the cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, and they all drank from it. And he said to them, this is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for many. Assuredly, I say to you, I will no longer drink of the fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new in the kingdom of God. And when they had sung a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. Oh, I'm gonna go into that a little bit more next week, but you know, we're, we're so used to, after we do communion, we sing, I know it was the blood. I know it was the blood. But in this case, they had sang from the song. It said that they sang psalms from the psalms from 112 to 118. If you allow me to close this out this way, this is one of the hymns that they possibly sang from the 118th division of the psalms. Oh, give thanks unto the Lord, for he is good, because his mercy endureth forever. Let Israel now say that his mercy endureth forever. Let the house of Aaron now say that his mercy endureth forever. Let them now that fear the Lord say that his mercy endureth forever. I called upon the Lord in distress. The Lord answered me and he set me in a large place. The Lord is on my side. I will not fear. What can man do unto me? The Lord taketh my spirit. 
The Lord taketh my part with them that help me. Therefore shall I see my desire upon them that hate me. It is better to trust in the Lord than to put confidence in man. It is better to trust in the Lord than to put confidence in princes. All nations can pass me, can pass me about, but in the name of the Lord will I destroy them. They can pass me about. Yea, they can pass me about, but in the name of the Lord, I will destroy them. They can pass me about like bees. They are quenched as the fire of thorns. For in the name of the Lord, I will destroy them. Thou hast thrust sore at me that I might fall, but the Lord helped me. The Lord is my strength and song and has become my salvation. The voice of rejoicing and salvation is in the tabernacles of the righteous. The right hand of the Lord doeth violently. The right hand of the Lord is exalted. The right hand of the Lord doeth violently. I shall not die but live and declare the works of the Lord. The Lord hath chastened me sore, but he hath not given me over unto death. Open to me the gates of righteousness. I will go into them and I will praise the Lord. This gate of the Lord into which the righteous shall enter, I will praise thee for thou hast heard me and art become my salvation. The stone which the builder refused to become the headstone of the corner. This is the Lord's doing. It is marvelous in our eyes. This is the day which the Lord hath made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. Save now, I beseech thee, O Lord. I beseech thee, send now prosperity. Bless, blessed be he that cometh in the name of the Lord. We have blessed you out of the house of the Lord. As I wrap this up, God is the Lord which has showed us light. Blind the sacrifice with cords, even unto the horns of the altar. Thou art my God, and I will praise thee. Thou art my God, I will exalt thee. Let us pray. Father, we praise you. We thank you. We thank you for this time just to worship together, Lord. We ask you to touch everyone that heard your word, Lord. Just the one that does not know you, help them sur to surrender to you now. Help us that have said yes to you and are living for you, Lord, to be encouraged, to be inspired, to see the wonderful things that you've done and how through your son coming to earth, he revealed himself to us. And these are things that we can learn about Jesus, his love, his pite, his, his might, his power, his obedience, his faithfulness. Lord, we thank you and we praise you. I give the glory in Jesus' name, I pray, amen and amen. You're now back in the hands of Bishop Marcus. Glory to God, hallelujah. Pastor LJ, what a powerful, powerful presentation of Mark, the 14th chapter tonight. We're making our journey through the book of Mark. And our theme is what do you know about Jesus? Every morsel of this study of, of the book of Mark a man has demonstrated a, uh, 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 a part of Jesus, a part of his ministry, a part of who Jesus is so that we might know him and the power of his resurrection. And I want you to know today that we haven't yet gotten to his resurrection, but we're getting close because he had to die before his resurrection. And on tonight, we have received a precursor of the death of Jesus. 
One of the questions that I need to ask you as we close is, are you willing to sacrifice in a, 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 a love, a, a, a abundance of love to Jesus? But are you walking in the steps of Judas where our teacher tonight said, amen, that he never knew Jesus, walked with him and never truly knew him. Amen. I want you to know tonight, amen, that there are so many people tonight who are appearing to be something that they are not. Amen. Are you truly walking with Jesus? What a powerful, it, 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 time will not allow me to say the things that are on my heart. Amen. But I hope that you have taken the time to walk through the word of the Lord. Man, as you see, we have something great that will be the continuation of tonight on next week. Amen. So thank you once again, Pastor LJ. Amen. Uh, I am Bishop Marcus Irving. Man, you have joined Albina Christian Life Center, our Wednesday night Bible study. And uh, once again, we want to ask you the question, what do you know about Jesus? Let me remind you once again that we all will be wearing white. I'm asking everyone from Albany Christian Life Center to wear white to our Pentecost Sunday. And it's amazing. A man, Pentecostal Sunday comes 50 days after Easter. And here we get to this portion of our Bible study at the very same time that that precious gift of the Holy Ghost, amen, has been uh, uh, provided for through the, the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ, amen. God bless you tonight. We trust that you'll have a blessed week. And uh, I want to say thank God for those of you who have joined us. I see Aretha uh, Johnson is with us. Percy Davis, God bless you, amen. I, uh, you have followed us, uh, uh, and I, uh, I'm always glad to see you. And Sister Johnson and, and Sister Irving, and I have a friend here, Sam Gardner, a man who has joined us, and uh, Sister Lynette, my son-in-law who's been in the hospital, Tony Cash. Amen. We're so glad for each one of you tonight, those of you who are watching on Facebook as well as on YouTube. May God richly be with you, amen, until we meet again. Amen.